this pomp and circumstance is the most splendid face of the infantryman's life. The weapon drills, the gorgeous uniforms, the disciplined formations are now just part of a glittering ceremony. But it wasn't always so. Once they were essential for victory on the battlefield, and the thin red lines on parade here are a reminder of the harsh reality of the infantryman's job. It is he who must go forward to close with and to kill the enemy. It is he who must seize the ground and hold it. And he must do this on foot, armed only with what he can carry, at the mercy of the elements and over every sort of terrain. There's nothing remote about war for the infantryman. For him, war has, and has always had, a very personal dimension. The infantryman is the pawn in the game of war. His work is unromantic and unremitting. He lives on his feet and by his wits, hung about with equipment, carrying his personal weapon, trying to stay vigilant despite the monotony. For the British riflemen on patrol in Northern Ireland, there's no prospect of a set-piece battle, just the constant threat of the sniper's bullet and the infantryman's universal experience of having to do his soldiering far from home. Hello. Let's talk, Dave. It's Not mine. Not mine. Why is that? Are you guys going to cheese around here? I would be to get it done first. It's still doing the time, is it? The Roman legionary also knew all about hours of sentry duty in distant outposts. He had the same concerns as other generations of infantrymen, getting a hot meal, keeping his kit clean, and going out on patrol. When the legionary marched out of camp, he carried his world with him. Helmet, weapons, equipment, rations, about 60 pounds in all, much the same as the British foot soldier carried on the Somme in 1916. In ancient Rome, the infantryman was nicknamed Marius's mule. In Vietnam, they called him the grunt. A grunt is an infantryman who has a couple of hundred pounds of gear on his back. He hasn't slept regularly, he hasn't eaten regularly, he hasn't washed or shaved regularly, and he's probably wearing the same clothes for three or four days. And I think the, the term grunt evolves from the sounds that you make once you sit down. If you have a pack on your back that weighs 60 or 80 pounds, bandoliers of ammunition and a cartridge belt that's another 80 pounds, when you get up, you grunt. When you walk, you grunt. Everything becomes an effort. Anytime there's a firefight, anytime there's any kind of... Uh, an incident. Most of this gear is dropped, but for the most part, you're trudging through the bush wearing packs, helmets, in some cases a flak jacket, but in the vast cases, uh, armaments, ammunition, carrying a rifle. Uh, you're a bearer. You're a... We didn't have pack horses. You were your own pack horse. The Napoleonic infantryman shouldered a crushing load. Musket, powder, ball, bayonet, short sword, water bottle, and pack. In the pack went shirts, socks, washing, cleaning kit, and greatcoat. One soldier wrote that many of our infantry sank and died under the weight of their knapsacks alone. It's a burden that hasn't changed much down the years. The sheer weight of weapons and equipment still makes the infantryman's life hard. Look, McGuinness, you keep stopping, you're going to make me annoyed. And you'll be going down the hill and up it and down it for the rest of the day. Now get yourself moving. Get moving. Move. You aren't trying. You're not even well sweating. Go, go, You're resting right now, every man. five minutes. Move do yourself. Rest yourself. Go, go. Then do the rest by yourself. Come on, on Stevie. Oh, I can't walk. Come on, by yourself. Get up by yourself. Get off your rifle. Get off your rifle. It's not a walking stick. Well and done. get yourself moving. Well done, You're son. Come on. Come by yourself. This looks like old-fashioned training, but it's what modern war was like in the Falklands. If Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton, then Goose Green was won on the Brecon Beacons. 
the terrain itself is the major part of the infantryman's job because 99.9% of the job is covering the ground. It doesn't matter whether it's the snows of Norway or the Falklands or the desert. It's, it's fighting your way through those obstacles, wading the river, getting up that next hill and the next one and down the other side, fixing the rope so you can climb up the cliff and getting down the other side and, and fighting your way through the elements. And then and only then do you actually get to grips with the enemy. Before he can get to grips with the enemy, the infantryman has first to cross that dangerous space in between. It may be a no-man's land of shell craters or the channel on the way to the Normandy shore. I don't know how long we were actually in, in the channel. Quite some time, it seemed, with all the issues of brown paper bags to be sick in and so on. And the feeling, I think, it seems to me, was curious, curiously resigned. I can't remember actually feeling uh, much apprehension. I know in my case, I kept uh, wondering really uh, what was going to happen to me. Would I ever get back home? You know, I kept thinking of my mother and my girlfriend, and I just wondered if I would make it, you know? I think the first time when one really is sort of got a sinking feeling, rather like a boxer before he goes into a ring, uh, was as one moved towards the shore, when there was an enormous amount of fire, mostly our own, and a great deal of noise. By the time we got a few hundred yards off the shore, of course, fire was coming in our direction. finally put the ramp down, I said to myself, how come he's putting it down now? Why can't we go in further? Because when he dropped us off, we were in water, I'd say knee high, but in areas it was up to our, our neck. And I had come to uh, uh, like the security of being in that boat. Such feelings are as old as man. In 55 BC, the Romans were equally reluctant to disembark and confront British tribesmen on the shore of Kent. Julius Caesar tells how an eagle bearer gave the lead. He shouted, jump down, soldiers, unless you wish to betray your eagle to the enemy. It shall be told that I did my duty to my country and my general. He jumped overboard and began to wade ashore. Crossing the last few hundred yards is the hardest of all. The enemy is no longer a distant, impersonal figure. He's close, threatening, and his weapons are deadly. The Greek Xenophon watched the Persians deploy for the Battle of Kunaxa in 401 BC. When they got nearer, then suddenly there were flashes of bronze and the spear points and the enemy formations became visible. <coughs> Two lines were hardly six or seven hundred yards apart when the Hellenes began to chant the battle hymn and moved against the enemy. came to dominate the battlefield, the advancing infantry had to run the gauntlet of musketry and artillery fire. Captain Charles Francois was at Borodino in 1812. Our regiment was ordered to advance. When we reached the crest of the ravine, we were riddled with grape shot. Then came the searing volleys of close-range musketry. As the years went by, firepower grew in range and accuracy. In the American Civil War, the experience faced by the foot soldiers as they advanced became grim indeed. On the 3rd of July, 1863, 
At the height of the Battle of Gettysburg, 15,000 Confederate infantry marched up this gentle slope towards the Union lines at the top. Some shells burst among them long before they neared the crest. But when they were about 200 yards from it, the defending infantry and artillery opened fire simultaneously. Canister from the guns ploughed through the Confederates and their ranks were raked with massed rifle fire. The advancing soldiers were actually hidden under a cloud of dust with, in the air above it, all sorts of debris, muskets, knapsacks, portions of bodies. A Union officer recalled that when the shot and shell struck the advancing inventory, a moan went up from the field, distinctly to be heard amid the roar of battle. About half the attacking troops were hit, and one Confederate later lamented, we gained nothing but glory and lost our bravest men. 60 years later, infantry had a similar problem on the Western Front as they went forward across no man's land to attack the trenches opposite. It was often a costly business, as Charles Carrington learned. I knew it would be a very expensive battle. I went into, into action with three officers, myself and two others under me, 13 NCOs and 109 men. I came back with one officer, myself, two NCOs, and with 44 men. Then comes the moment when the infantryman meets his enemy. For centuries, although battle involved thousands of men, combat was a series of individual fights, and most of the damage was done within the short radius of a man's sword arm. Even firearms did not end close combat. In 1689, at Kelly Cranky in Scotland, government troops found their muskets and plug bayonets no answer to charging Highlanders, plying dirk and broadsword. Even in the 20th century, there are times when the infantryman finds himself fighting hand to hand man against man. When I went into hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy, I, uh, I really didn't like that person, whoever he may be. And consequently, I didn't even think of him as another human being. I just saw him as an enemy that had to be defeated. And at the time that I sunk my bayonet into his body, uh, I didn't really give it too much thought then, but when it come time to pull out my bayonet, I found that it was quite difficult. And so I couldn't do it by just pulling it out. So I had to fire my rifle into his chest so that uh, at the same time I could pull my, my round out. And I, I think I wasn't satisfied. I used the butt of my rifle and uh, struck him somewhere on the head. I don't know exactly to make sure that it was all over. You know, he wasn't coming back at me. The infantryman has got a peculiar ability which really not vested in anybody else. In the middle of a battle, he can take a decision to take cover in a convenient fold in the ground and take no further part in the battle, or he can lie in the bottom of his slit trench when the enemy artillery is pouring down round about him. Or alternatively, he can take the opposite decision, which is to throw his all into a single act of great courage and gallantry. That ability isn't vested with others. If you're in a tank, you go where your tank goes. If you're with an artillery piece, you go where that goes. But this particular ability of the infantryman to make his own decision is something which is peculiar to him. If, in some essentials, the experience of the infantryman has changed remarkably little, in one fundamental respect, it has undergone a revolution. The personal weapon he uses has altered beyond all recognition. It's the capabilities of that weapon that dictate the sort of battle he faces and fights. Nowadays, he will use and meet something like this. It's a rifle, of course. It's the Soviet-designed Kalashnikov AK-47, perhaps the most common of all 20th century infantry weapons. But it's a comparatively recent phenomenon. For most of war's long history, it was edged weapons that shaped the infantryman's experience.